So welcome everybody back to the second half of the Labby Bina meeting. Uh, Bina is kicking off. Uh, Labby set a high standard for us, so let's hope we can keep up the high standard. Um, I am Nikki Biling. I'm the Bina program coordinator, and I will uh, introduce Claire Brown, our Bina co-chair, to take over from me. But first, I wanted to whoops, go ahead and thank our sponsors once again all of our sponsors and specifically our platinum and gold sponsors. So we really do appreciate the support of AVR Optics and Zeiss, Brooker, Thermo Fisher and Tissue Diagnostics. They really helped make this meeting happen for us. So really very much appreciate the support and hope that we can continue to rely on you in future years when we hold events like this. Um, so without too much further ado, I will hand it over to Claire who has a few words to share and a uh, little surprise thank you to, to do for us. So welcome back everybody. Um, we have an exciting uh, two and a half days planned for you now with uh, Bina. So we have a lot of um, sessions about different uh, training and education and technology, image informatics, core facility management. We're gonna be talking about managing and sharing image data, What's the impact of the training and education that we're doing? And then wrap up on Friday with training, or sorry, technology development and disseminating that to the biologists who need new technologies. So we really look forward to, uh, to the next few days with everybody and uh, are excited to hear all the presentations and, and the conversations that we have. I wanted to start off with a, a little bit of an introduction um, to Michael Davidson. So I wanted to do a little show of hands. Is there anybody here who, who knew him? Uh, no? Few? Anybody who's heard of him? Okay. And I'm gonna ask all the people in the audience who haven't put up their hands to put up your hand if you've used one of the reagents and just put up your hand because you've used one of his reagents. <laughs> so, so I wanted to just give a little bit of, of history. Um, um, he passed away in 2015 and left a, a big hole to fill because he was just so amazing to the community. And um, I would, when I was putting these slides together, I realized he was doing all the things we're talking about, but but back in the 90s, you know, he was doing training and education, career development, mentorship, partnerships with companies. He was just so so innovative. So he was a researcher, a photographer, a mentor, an entrepreneur. He had over 100 publications and over 600 journal and magazine covers. Um, I had the pleasure of going to his lab at uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee for the um, Olympus Bioscapes contest one year. And he gave me a tour of his lab and told me lots of fantastic stories. He was a really good storyteller. So he started off his microscopy career taking images of computer chips. And apparently the way that the, the companies patent their computer chips is they put these hidden cartoons on the chips. And so he would image them and provide them back to the company so that if anyone was, if they had any claims of somebody taking their chips, they, they knew exactly, you know, they had the image of exactly what was on the chip and could see if, if the technology had been, been taken. And he really was doing this as, uh, as his job. He, so he was receiving the computer chips from the, the chip manufacturers and imaging them. He also was uh, just seminal in training and education. So um, I would guess that everybody here has seen some of his uh, work at some point. He developed the Molecular Expressions website. He developed the Zeiss website, the Nikon website, and the Olympus website. And um, it's uh, one of the largest collections of, of photo micrographs um, still you can find on the Molecular Expressions webpage. And he also published a very seminal book, which I think is still one of the best books in optical microscopy, Fundamentals of Light Microscopy and Electronic Imaging with um, Doug Murphy. And the way that he developed all these tools was, was as a mentor. So he had this whole pipeline of high school students and undergraduate students from the university who would come into his lab and they would learn um, different to, different skill sets. So some of them did web development, some of them did the graphic design. So like a figure like this one uh, you can see here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but those were, were graphic design. So he trained the students how to do graphic design. And then these are interactive web tutorials. So he also had people who did coding 
to develop these tutorials. And he would bring these kids in with no experience. He had a whole pipeline of you know people with more experience. And then they would go off and get jobs with advertising companies or microscope companies or newspapers. And it was just, uh, you could just see the, sh the kind of glimmer in his eye when he was, was showing you what he was doing and the number of students that he impacted. He also um, developed fluorescent proteins. So he had a policy that whenever a fluorescent protein came into his lab, he did the molecular biology himself and he would cut it out and make it blue, green, yellow, red, every color he had. And his freezers were actually color coded. So he had a blue freezer, a green freezer, an orange freezer and a red freezer. And he was so organized. He had everything um, all done up. And then he was also testing newer versions, modifying, I believe he he created M Emerald, M Apple. I'm sure there's others. He he did the custom modifications himself. And then when he found out he was um, sick with cancer, one of the first things he was is, what am I going to do with my plasmids? And he right away made plans to donate them to AdGene. So he donated over 5,000 fluorescent proteins to AdGene, and I'm just showing one one here. And uh, so I'm guessing some of you have probably used his his work without maybe knowing. Um, he also worked with the, with the companies, so he had corporate partners. And he uh, any of the earlier camera um, response curves, were, he would do those. And he told me he had never bought any equipment in his life. So he would get the camera company. They would say, can you give us the you know, exposure curve on our, on our new CCD? And he would say, sure, I just need a camera. And I know you don't need it back, right? And so they would give him the camera and he would characterize it and then they would have it for their, their brochures and he would have a camera for one of his microscopes. He did the same with filter cubes, um, doing the filter spec curves. And uh, he consulted on microscope hardware and software. And then he did all the web design and maintenance. So an image like this from Carl Zeiss, he would have had his graphic designers do the, the um, work to make this figure. And he would have had them do these uh, curves that you find on the websites as well. So the reason um, this came up with the meeting this year is um, he was also an entrepreneur. And uh, he met a... Um, uh, American who was in the fashion industry, Erwin Sternberg, and he was, I, I don't remember how they met, but he was telling him how hard it is for them to come up with new textile designs, and that uh, the textile artists, you know, you can only make so many checkered patterns before you kind of lose inspiration. So they came up with this idea of taking microscope images and using that to inspire the textile artists. Now, he told me the, the first story, which was actually a failure. They started out with moon rocks. So they were doing this in the 70s, and they thought, let's do moon rocks. Everybody's so excited about the moon landing. Uh-uh. <laughs> they were all blue and gray and dull, and it didn't take off. I don't know how they had the inspiration, but they decided to go with cocktails. And so he would dry different cocktails on a microscope slide and then take polarized images of the cocktails. And so now you could buy your favorite uh, um, friend a martini tie or a gin and tonic tie and, and so on. So this really took off. And the uh, Sternberg had a store, a fashion store in New York, and it just took off. And Michael Davidson took all of his proceeds and invested them back in his lab. And that was how he really expanded his lab to, to get into web design and having all these students and the fluorescent proteins and everything. The picture here on this slide is interesting. It's him at the Nikon Small World competition in 1994. And in front of him are actually 35 millimeter slides. And that's how people submitted their images for the contest. They, they mailed in 35 millimeter slides. So we were recently contacted by um, people who have uh, the remainder of the scarves and the ties. And Bina was uh, able to purchase them at a very reasonable price. We got the end of the stock. So we have these beautiful scarves here. And Nikki is showing one of the wine ties. So uh, we will have some of these for gifts throughout the, the conference. 
And we want to start uh, by giving the first two away to uh, Allison North, who has been co-chair of BINA since the beginning and has uh, recently stepped down to focus on other things. And Meredith Calvert, who uh, has been treasurer of BINA from the start and has also recently stepped down. So. So don't worry, Allison and Meredith are staying involved with Bina. They're just uh, stepping down from those roles. So uh, we're now going to move into the programming. So uh, we first have our video from the communications and the diver diversity and equity working groups, which uh, Vanessa is going to pull up on YouTube. Okay, thank you. So we will kick things off with our first session, which is on technology training. And our moderator for this session is our wonderful board member, Phil Hochberg, who will take it away and introduce our next three speakers who are going to talk about uh, technology training between the US, Canada, and Mexico. Thank you, Nikki. Welcome, everyone. A lot of familiar faces who've already seen two days of various educational programs and opportunities uh, at the Labby meeting. And so we're going to continue with that um, theme uh, in this session. The session is titled Technology Training and Education. And hopefully you will all see uh, that there are opportunities for all of you to learn and even to put into practice some of what you're going to see here today. Each of our speakers uh, has spent a considerable amount of time developing uh, educational programs that they're going to describe for you today. First speaker will be Allison North, and the title is Intensive Microscopy Courses in North America. <laughs> that was the word. Thank you. What we do that, Vanessa. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. It is great to be here to speak in Mexico to all of you. Um, and I'm going to be introducing the topic, as Phil said, of intensive microscopy courses in North America. So the first question is, why would you even think of attending one of these? And there are many, many benefits from it. First of all, you're going to learn from experts in all kinds of modalities. I think it's important that you've got a dedicated time away from your institution so you can really focus on learning the whole thing instead of worrying about the day-to-day -day things. Um, you see hands-on demos and you gain exposure to different types and makes of microscope. You forge long-lasting relationships with the other participants and also with the faculty. I think it's very important. Uh, people get to try their own specimens with unfamiliar modalities, so a microscope they've never even thought of using before, which may turn out to be the key. Likewise, they may learn some kind of practical tip, which will actually sort out their project for them. And really, what we care about is that people will just fall in love with microscopes, and that was Courtney, who was a student a few years ago. So where are these courses held? So sadly, there are only a few of them in the States. I wish there were more. Um, and they're, as you see, they're varying lengths. I'm sure there are far more than these. I can't cover them all in one slide. But at the top, there are the two held at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. There's the one I co-direct, the OMIBS course in the fall. And then there's AQLM in the spring. And they're pretty similar. They're about 10 days. Then there is the one that Jennifer Waters leads at the Cold Spring Harbor a lab, which is, oh, I've skipped that one. That's about 14 days long and includes image analysis. Then there's uh, Samuel, uh, Samuel Watkins course at the Mount Desert Island in Maine. And that's about one week long. Um, and then you get uh, like the advanced imaging methods course in Berkeley, which is more specialized and shorter. And then there are other 
short courses which specialize in a certain technique like the light sheet course or in a, um, something like threat. So there are many choices. I did want to think for a minute about what other courses would be helpful to the imaging community. And it strikes me that we have a real dearth of courses on sample preparation. And uh, I think this is really important. The Cold Spring Harbor course before Jennifer's time was directed by John Murray and I used to co-teach it. And it actually covered fluorescence in situ hybridization as well as fluorescence microscopy and had a lot of ensemble prep and that's kind of gone. And likewise, there was a histochemistry course at the MBL, which I noticed is not being offered this year. I don't know whether that's disappeared for good. So I think we need this, particularly as we um, take up the omics, people need to be more concerned with um, sample prep. More courses on image analysis as well. Um, there's now a deep learning course at the MBL for the last couple of years. And according to Florian Jürg, it is heavily oversubscribed. And many of us are still sending our own staff across to Europe to attend the fabulous Neubius training schools uh, because they're so wonderful. And then we need courses on how to build your own microscope. This is becoming more and more popular as we get all the open source stuff. The good news is Bina is working on the second and third needs and you're gonna hear more about that during the meeting, but I still think there's a problem with the first. Okay, so if we can only accommodate a limited number of students per course, for us it's 24 on the OMOOCs course, you might ask yourself, does this really have a big effect on the imaging community at large? I've sometimes wondered this, is it a bit elitist? But the truth is, when we pick our, our participants, we think very carefully about who will have a major amplification effect beyond their own needs. So we look for recent PIs who are going to set up their own labs, or people who work in cores or direct cores or in industry, anyone who is likely to pass their knowledge on to other people. And Bina, of course, in itself is a fantastic amplifier. And I had a new idea, by the way, after I heard Alenka Lovi's talk, um, it struck me, we could really uh, increase the amplification by asking the lecturers at our courses if they wouldn't mind contributing the same lecture to a virtual course um, somewhere in Latin America. So I, th I think I'll say yes when I ask them. Pretty sure. Anyway, so this is a PI who came from being a postdoc at Rockefeller and she attended the course and now she's moved on to set up her own lab um, in Texas and she doesn't have a core facility there. And she said, she wrote this email to me in which she said the fundamental training that she got, you know, thanks to you and your team has allowed me to train them properly. I hear her own staff and they're doing amazing work. And the great thing is it also allows me to design more ambitious and potentially more impactful projects. And I can tell you, this is someone who was terrified of microscopes when she first started in my call. So what's the general format of these courses? So they're generally a combination of lectures, um, lab demos and practicals, exercises and discussions. And we tend to intersperse, intersperse the practicals in between the lectures so that we're reinforcing what they've learned and also keeping the students awake. So on the right is this, Jörg likes to color code all the different things. It's just a sort of quick example. And we have a whole load of lectures that come in and out throughout the course. So they're not there for the whole time. We have about 20 faculty. And then we have a load of additional sessions that have gone very well, such as we always do a demo of the Abbey Diffraction Kit. Luckily, there is one of these at the MBL held in, in, in treasure by our local Zeiss guru at the moment, Chris Bjornsson. We do vendor tech bites. We do a career panel to highlight alternative careers within um, outside traditional academic roles. And we ask the vendors to contribute to that. We run basic Fiji workshops, but we do not have time to cover image analysis. And then we have a session at the end of which we've always had on ethics, but now we've extended this to good practices in microscopy and metadata and why it's so important. We have these sessions where the participants learn to build a microscope on rails using these lenses and filters that are literally assembled with Thor Labs kits. Um, thank you to Thor Labs who provide these. And we get amazing results. So uh, on the right, Philippe actually built one of these and image tardigrades, made a movie and face contrast on his own microscope and uh, won first prize in our imaging contests, which we always hold. Jörg persuaded me to start the course each time with this grand overview of the course. Um, I resisted at first, but I think it's actually very good because what we do in the first lecture is just tell them everything they're gonna learn as they go along. And the great thing is it actually helps set expectations. So before they were kind of panicking, am I gonna hear about this later? Am I gonna hear about that? And now they know exactly when it's gonna come. So what do you need to run a successful course? Well, first of all, I think it's important if you have two course directors that you pick people whose skills and knowledge complement each other. Uh, they're not too similar. I've highlighted in color the people that are most important in our view, and those are the course managers. So they 
Jacqueline and Mark at the moment, they really like keep the thing running. And to keep it running, they also need a, a great team of course facilitators. And I'm not joking when I say they don't mind being sleep deprived. I don't think they get any sleep, honestly. Then we have this amazing team of academic faculty who come through the course. Um, the vendor faculty, though, are so important. And all the ones who come, they have this amazing love of teaching. That's why they're coming. And they're very knowledgeable and very dedicated. And then the MBL, we have great administrative support. We also have wonderful applicants every year. It's really hard to, ch to uh, choose between them and we need funding to help them attend. So this is just like a picture, but it doesn't include all the people because they say they come and go. So it's a lot of people. As I say, good to find a co-director with complementary skills. So I picked my co-director, Jörg Beversdorf, because he's a physicist in academic research and I'm a co-director and a biologist. And it has turned out to be really, really good. And amazingly, I really put him high on a pedestal. I'm in awe of him, but he loves the practical tips that I bring from having done things in the lab. That's incredible. And he also loves ice cream. And uh, the entire team loves ice cream. So we always get that first night for our ice cream. So what are the benefits to the companies of supporting these courses? So the course depends, as I say, hugely on the involvement of our partners. This is Louise Bertrand from Leica, just packing up just a few of the Leica scopes at the end. It doesn't show the whole range. So it's amazing. And actually, during the course, we, they're not allowed to promote their systems. They are there purely for education, to talk to the students and teach them how to use the systems. So to try and thank them, we try and use social media like Twitter. I go tweeting pictures of them all. The career panel. Um, which hopefully will enhance recruitment to the companies in the end, the Tech Bytes, where we encourage them to actually do a commercial spiel. And then we throw this commercial, commercial faculty appreciation event now every year, which is hysterical because they pay for it, but they still love it because they say it's the first time they felt appreciated. So <laughs> that's fine. And the Tech Bytes, of course, I stole from the UK, uh, meeting with something in there, but ours are now better, sorry, because uh, they're done live. And, and this was the inimitable Jim Sims from Hamamatsu demonstrated low noise camera chips using nothing but two pieces of carpet and a bag of popcorn kernels. And I will explain afterwards to anyone who wants to know how he did this, but he won this prize. Now you can see the next year he's wearing a, a medal. They've become so competitive. It's quite out of control, but it's fun and the students vote on the winners. Okay, so how do you get funding to attend them? So maybe being a personal development funds, there are sources such as the Histo Histochemical Society. I saw an email, the Microscopy Society of America, just on the Confocal List server this week. Um, some of the longer courses have grants supporting them, ours does not, but clearly this is not enough. We lost two students this year because, from Argentina and Africa because even with these bursaries, they could not afford to come. So how can we address this? And I want to try and work together with our corporate partners to see if we can get some kind of sponsorship so that people can attend from other countries. The professional development program by Bina is incredibly important. You can see here on the on the right side all the different courses and workshops it's supported this year. And Nikki asked me to remind you that it's accepting submissions through till October the 6th. So if you have a course that needs support, please request support for it. You won't necessarily get it, but you might as well ask. And there are a lot of success stories from these uh, uh, PD recipients who go to them. And one of ours would be Michael Almeida. Um, I think the writing is very small here, but basically he had a fantastic time at OMIPS. And at the end, he said, I will extend the critical knowledge and techniques to faculty members and train a new generation of biomedical researchers in my institution. Right, everybody can say that, right, can't they? But in the end, he did it. Just nine months later, he set up a mi uh, microscope training course for undergraduate research at UNC Pembroke, which is traditionally serving underrepresented groups. And he's also a current member of the BINA DEI group. And he wrote to me, I'm following your advice in the course, spread the knowledge from OMIDS. So this is what Vina can do. So other OMIDS and al uh, alumni that I've encountered include Feather Ives, who we've seen as co-chair of the DEI working group, Lane Manning, who I hope, yes, he's here at the back now and he's working for AVR Optics, very popular person. And Cindy and Amy, I have pictures here and they both attended recently. And then I bumped into them again at the Montreal Train the Trainers course. So it is so nice when you encounter someone who is at your course. And then I don't know how many others in the room may have been to these courses because I just discovered this week that Alenka had attended one of the MBL courses, we think AQLM, and also the Vancouver one that I did. So it's amazing how we all go from one place to another. Okay, how do you find out about them? This is where the Bina newsletter is incredibly handy. It announces them all to you, there they are, fabulous. 
So why hold a course at the MBL rather than somewhere else? So first of all, there's this strong tradition of microscopy there. There's a huge institutional support, and that's important. When you, need to, when you want to host a course, you have to think about all these things. Martha and now Maya were incredibly important with vendor coordination. There's also excellent facility uh, support from the local imaging facility, thanks to Louis Kerr, who is actually a member of our corporate partners group. And then there are year-round researchers on site with novel microscopy techniques. And just on the right is um, a list from Bob Hard, who used to be co-director of the course. And he used to love to list all his cutting equipment and things that had happened at the course, including the first Nobel laureate to receive his award during one of our lectures and the first ISIM demo at a course. We have a tradition of great mentors coming through the course, and you won't believe this, but I had no idea that Claire was going to show the slides that she did this morning, and we talked to each other and found out. So there was, I was also going to show Mike Davidson as one of these great mentors, and I was thrilled to find this bench outside the MBL in his memory this year and sit on it for a little while. So the MBL is home to lots of microscopies with unique home-built systems, like Abhishek Kumar, who's here, and people get to see his microscopes. And then there's also Rudolf Oldenburg and Michael Schreback, uh, who have all kinds of fun microscopes. And let me see if I can click on this. No, uh, no, no, I can't click and hold. Oh, there it goes. This is a tardigrade. Who, uh, who doesn't love a tardigrade? I am Anna Lyons won first prize this year. And this was taken on Michael Schreback's orientation independent, sorry, partner, polychromatic polarization microscope. Okay, so why run such a course just to end? Why would you want to do it? Because I can tell you it's a hell of a lot of work and it's probably sucked up 10 to 20% of my working hours over the last few years. But the answer is it is unbelievably energizing. You arrive there thinking, why do I do this? And at the end you say, I want to come back. It's fun. It's passionate. Everybody is positive. Nobody's whining about charges or any of the normal stuff. They just want to do science and everybody's working towards a common goal. It's also held in a lovely environment. People establish networks, as I said, but the biggest thank you really is just seeing the big smiles on the participants' faces. This is Seth, a former manager on the right, wearing his squid hat as he re retired. And I just want to say, you never know where your future may lie with these courses. So this is my certificate from being a student in the year 2000. I knew I loved it there. I knew I wanted to come back. I never dreamed in a hundred years that I might go back and end up being a director. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And as we get ready for the next one, I'll remind you that we'll have... I'm on? Okay, so do I start it over? The people in, in Zoom didn't get... Okay, well, I'm going to talk about this, this project, Connecting the Mexican Bioimaging Community. And first of all, this is our, our logo, which was designed by a, by a very talented artist in, in Ensenada, where, where I, I come from. Uh, it's uh it's based on on the Maya on, on Mayan symbols and 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 the and, and light. So it also has some lenses and even some petri dishes right right in the in the bee. So uh, this project uh, I I am I consider myself very lucky to be to to have the the confidence to to become the the, the PI. Uh, Adan Guerrero and Chris Wood are are the the co PIs for for this project, so it was really really fun uh, writing up the, the the request and coming up with the idea for for the for the whole uh, uh, program. So uh, the goals for the project are are, are here. Uh, it's to to create uh, these alliances between different core facilities. I have to mention that for for me, well, well I have uh, been working in a, in a core facility for. Uh, close to to six or seven or seven years, and when I first started uh, working in the core facility, for me it was a, a new concept. I didn't knew that that such a thing existed, so it was discovering a lot of, of different uh, obstacles in my in my personal training. Also, I had to to understand that I had to learn a lot to to uh, give back to to the students which I have to train or the users that were uh, in the in the facility. So. This uh, past six years have been for me a lot of of of, of, of knowledge. Uh, the one of the goals is to improve the training practices of all the different core facilities. Each facility has their own their own style, uh, sometimes dictated by their own institutions. So 
we are uh, learning a lot of the different ways that all of the core facilities are working and, and learning from, from the different uh, techniques and, and aspects. Um, we also want to, to um, improve uh, or well to the, the implementation of different techniques that may not be available in different in different laboratories. Uh, each, each laboratory has its own uh, users. So the, the, the needs are specific for each lab. So learning about what other labs are doing, about the, the implementation of new techniques, the development of new techniques, it's really important because that, that way we can network and then we recommend uh, different users to go to, to, other, to other facilities. Uh, another important objective is to increase the awareness and the adoption of, of techniques in the general community. And for this, uh, I want to, to say that the community, uh, I think we're looking even to the future. We're, we're thinking of people that are not really part of the community yet, but will be part of the community. So we are thinking on, on students, even from, from uh, middle school, from uh, high school, undergrads, who may or might be interested in, in, in microscopy. So we try to, to engage them and, and keep them interested in, in, in microscopy. So for this, we, we, I will talk a little bit more about our outreach events. Uh, an, an emergent uh, goal was to establish a social observatory. I will also talk about this uh, a little bit further and register Mexico Bioimaging, which uh, when the, for the, the ones that were here at LAVI already know a little bit about this, but I will finish up talking more, more about this, this, this point. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is Mexico. And all of those uh, red spots on the on the map are the sites for our first uh, for our project. This is where the the workshops are being held uh, last year, this year, and and the following year, which is uh, the the period that we have uh, support. Uh, Me Mexico, it's a it's a meme. It's a mega diverse country, so that diversity it's reflected in the in in, in the cultural aspects. And also in the availability to to resources. So, I have I have to mention something that that uh, in the in the seventies or eighties, the Mexican government uh, tried to 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 do up uh, the, the, this politics of of decentralizing the science. So most of the of the red dots that you see further away from Mexico City belong to uh, federally funded institutions. So I think it's really really important that we have different uh, core facilities in different institutions. Some are universities and some are uh, federally funded uh, 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 institutions. So I think that's that's really remarkable of, of this. This is this is our first our first team. These are the local organizers. So for for uh, assembling our team of, of, of organizers, we, we uh, contacted uh, them. Not all of them, more people, but they are the ones that answered the, our first call. So we are really, really grateful for for all of them. Uh, a lot of them are here here present. If you want to raise your hand, so so people can can see you. Yes. <laughs> and right here, uh, they they are put in in chronological order of 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 the workshops. So. Uh, we we have uh, a plan for 12 workshops six of them based on fundamentals on on microscopy and the other six on advanced microscopy so for this we we include a uh, super resolution we include uh, well different types of of super resolution confocal and even uh, electron microscopy and the fundamentals on microscopy are uh, more directed towards um, people that need microscopy or don't know that they need microscopy uh, that they have projects that might that microscopy might might be useful for and it's it's uh, really uh, uh, open for for the whole for the whole community so we 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 don't restrict our our calls for for a specific uh, group of of people we we have people that are undergrads we have researchers we have technicians we all always emphasize this this part that that we we want to 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 train to 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 engage with with staff scientists with um, technicians that work maybe at universities doing maintenance to 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 microscopes and 
in that last circle, uh, I'm talking about the outreach and social appropriation of science events, which are uh, integrated in the design of each of, of our workshops. So the, the fundamentals of microscopy uh, are open for regional participation. These are uh, restricted to, to the neighboring states. We have a little less budget for this, but we, we, we try to, to, to include people from around the, the, the neighboring states. For advanced mi microscopy, it's a national participation. It's open for the whole for the whole country. This is uh, these are longer workshops. They are uh, for four plus one days. That plus one, it's the outreach event. And uh, for this, we have budget for international guest professors, which which uh, has uh, really contributed to to making our events uh, uh, the, the quality much much higher. And for our outreach and social appropriation of science events, which uh, are one day. Uh, we have uh, fold scopes and also 3D printed microscope, which uh, I'm sure you 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 saw at uh, earlier today at the LNMA, uh, printed and explained by Aide. Uh, the these these events are held in public and private schools, also science museums, and also in public parks. Well, we haven't tried this. This will be a, an experiment uh, for our next workshop. We also want to 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 engage with uh, non-specialized uh, audience, and one of the one of the most uh, successful things about this this project it's the the Mexican bioimaging workshops ambassadors. So this was uh, an idea that that came up not from the microscopy community but from a social psychologist that had this this really really great idea of involving all of the the students the former students from the from the workshops and to to make them part of of the organization so we we have some of the ambassadors right here also if you can raise your hand so you can get your your applause and the and the ambassadors uh serve a fundamental functions so so we have more than 20 ambassadors all over all over mexico and they take care of, of our, our social networks. They uh, they are in charge of the virtual events. So I have to mention this that all of in starting from the second from the second workshop, we transmit we we make a virtual parallel uh, workshop. So even if someone is from outside the region, we they can have access to the virtual workshop, which has uh, a program alternative to the to the actual uh, presential. Uh, uh, program, um, they they are in charge of of all, all of the logistics for this for these virtual events. Also, uh, uh, recording, editing, and uploading everything to 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 YouTube, uh, and they also uh, support in the social appropriation of knowledge events. So uh, this just to show how we are growing. This is how when we started. Well, this is about the the third edition. And then we have more than a thousand followers. Uh, these are some examples of of what we have found and what what the different events have 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 done. Each each organizing committee has total freedom on the design of their of their program. So each each uh, institution or each each uh, core facility has their own style and their own priorities which is really interesting for example here in the in the left it's a, it's a, they're building a, a microscope that was done in 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 CIO in in Leon Guanajuato and this image from the from the right is uh the last uh the previous workshop that we held and on the on the left are the the presential uh participants and on the right are the, the virtual participants and also another thing that's really, really uh, remarkable of the of the ambassadors is that they they come up with this type of event. So when was the the International Day of of Women and and and, and kids in, in in science? They they came up with this with this idea, which was uh, broadcasted on our on our Facebook page. So uh, this this comes from the ambassadors, and they have total total uh, liberty to 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 this type of events. And I also want to mention this this uh, this example. We had a student in 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 a, in a workshop this year in in Mexico City. Uh, 
works, he works in uh, in this project called uh, traditional medicine and herbolaria. It's like using herbs uh, in in the northwest of, of Mexico. So he works with with indigenous people who use who use plants, who use native plants to to heal. And uh, he was really interested. He wanted to to bring to bring microscopy to to their local communities. So we gave him we gave him a par a pair of of fold scopes. He brought them back to the community, and these are the images of of people in a remote town in in Sonora using their their fold scopes to look at the plants that they collect to do their their preparation. So this was really really moving. And and another thing about our virtual workshops is that it's not just uh, a passive audience, they have to engage by doing uh, an infography or at least uh, sharing some of the work that they have done. And then we publish that on, on our Facebook page and our Instagram page. If you want to, to scan that, that, that QR code, you will uh, get to the, to the whole folder for this particular workshop. So uh, more about the social observatory of science. I see that some of you are using your, your cell phones. <laughs> I will leave it for a few seconds. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the work that, that Roberto uh, Lopez Olmedo is doing. He's a social psychologist. So we are uh, interested not only in, in connecting the Mexican bioimaging community, but also learning what the general community, uh, what's the general perception of, of microscopy in the general community. So he came up with, with, this, with this project uh, based on uh, semantic neural networks. Uh, this is a, a Google form that, that we present for, for, the, for, for the participants in the outreach events. So we, we measure the, the appreciation of, of microscopy before and after our our workshops and this is a, a presentation he went uh, to to Ensenada to present part of this of this work in a, in a festival also a, a, it's called the Festival del Conocimiento uh, the Knowledge Festival so he he shared what we are doing with with even a, a broader audience so uh, this has worked uh, really well and um, just to, to 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 finish up. These four, these four uh, words are the four questions that we ask our participants to to answer to 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 evaluate. So each each uh, each call for for applications for our our workshop uh, consists of these four four questions. So they have to to describe their intention, what's their experience in training, what are their expectations about the workshop. And how can they become part of the community? What can they give back to the community? So, so in a way, we are preparing them for 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 the workshop. And uh, well, here in the left, it's a, a an explanation of 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 what the what the workshop will be. We mentioned that uh, all all of the all of the people are, are are welcome from all of the academic levels and different and different positions. And just to 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 finish with this. Uh, these are our numbers for for the different workshops. Um, the the first one is the registration request. We've had uh, 293 and 330 are our records. These are uh, workshops held in Mexico City, which makes a lot of sense. It's the more more densely populated region of of Mexico. Uh, we've had 20 participants for each for each workshop. 30 participants for the uh, advanced microscopy in, in, in the uh, ecology and physiology workshop in, in Mexico City. And for the next workshop, we will also have 30 participants because they will be, this will be part of a, of, a, of a meeting. So we also, we have uh, increased our number of virtual attendees and here we have the, the states represented. So the, the Mexican states. And about uh, the, the outreach events, these are the our numbers. So we've had 200, these are middle school students. We've had uh, sessions in museums, science museums were with more than a hundred uh, uh, persons. Uh, I want to say kids, but they're persons. So we have to respect them, they're persons. Uh, and for the staff, this is this is really, really important. We really need to have a really big staff to to have the capacity to 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 engage with 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 all of them. And is my time up? Okay, my time is up. So, 
Nuestros ojos son parte de los cinco sentidos que nos permiten conocer el mundo, desde las gigantescas montañas hasta un minúsculo grano de arena. Podemos ver todo. Bueno, casi todo. ¿Has notado que cuando nos acercamos a un objeto que no vemos bien, hacemos visco para verlo mejor? Hasta parece más grande. Sin embargo, nuestra vista tiene límites. Siempre hemos sido curiosos y nos emociona entender más allá de lo que podemos mirar. Esta curiosidad nos llevó a inventar un artefacto capaz de ver lo invisible que puede aumentar. By biologic division of, of CSSE. And just to wrap this up, this was taken yesterday, and this is the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding for the Foundation of Mexico Bioimaging. So, thank you. Thank you, Diego. All right, now we're going to go and north of the border to Canada. And Phil Kessner give a presentation. Train the trainer program, successes, challenges, and future plans. Excellent. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, I am also Phil. I work at the Advanced Bioimaging Facility at McGill in Montreal, Canada. And yeah, I was invited here today to give you a talk about a course that we actually just ran two months ago called the Montreal Light Microscopy course, Train the Trainer. Uh, basically, the overall concept of the course was it was an offshoot of a rigorous three and a half day course we do on the fundamentals of light microscopy giving to students at McGill every March. We thought, how can we take this and tweak it? And instead of teaching the fundamentals, instead design it specifically to be those in the imaging world and instead go about teaching how we teach the fundamentals. So kind of thinking about it in a different way and really trying to take some of the ego out of it, not saying this is how you should do it, but this is how we do it instead. And then also to allow junior imaging scientists to network with senior members of the community. So there's basically three goals. The first intent was to provide a wealth of material to microscopists looking to build their own courses. So basically, not only just showing them how we go about doing these courses, but giving them all the slides we use, all the information about hands-on activities, so that they have access to it on a Google Drive and they can do whatever they want with it. Secondary element, as I just mentioned, was really to promote the networking between members of different facilities across many countries. And finally, to the future kind of goals for this is to one, keep the group connected as much as possible and build on the group, build on the materials and resources. So the basic format was that the members of the uh, imaging facility prior to the conference went through all the slide decks and annotated each slide. So basically in the notes section wrote about what we teach on them, what we kind of focus on, what to emphasize. And then we did instructional material was covered through the course in kind of this overview fashion, not going into the details again about the material because these people already know it. It was just about how we go about teaching this material. And then we'd break out in these small breakout rooms, so about five to 10 people in which we could discuss the material, say the positives, give criticisms, kind of add additional topics. And the kind of intimacy of these small groups, I think is where this really kind of took off. Then we come back together and discuss everything that was said in these groups as a group. So these are the topics that were covered in it. I'm not going to read over it for time constraints, but there were two at the bottom here that weren't part of the typical fundamentals course we do, course logistics and tech talks and running workshops with companies that Claire gave because she's great at these things. So again, because it was for these junior microscopists to kind of get this information that they might not already have. This is just a sample of the slide format. So everything again was taught with the notes at the bottom visible. And that was the focus, not the actual material, but what we annotated. So 
there were kind of instructors and participants, but the whole thing was very blurred lines. Like, for example, you know, I'm quite new to teaching courses, and I'm very new to teaching courses about teaching courses, and I'm extremely new to giving talks about courses about teaching courses. And, you know, but here we are. And I guess my only point really here is that some of the participants had 20 plus years in this. So it wasn't exactly an us and them type thing. It was only an us thing. But there were kind of roles that the instructors versus the participants actually performed during it. So the group at the facility did the slide annotation and lecturing of the course material as well as the hands-on activities. Uh, but uh, many other instructors were invited and they gave their expertise, opinions, and ideas during both the talks and in the breakout groups. And that was key on kind of one, being able to have these small groups and kind of getting new perspectives on everything. So here are all the instructors. It was a group from North America mostly, but we also had Karen from South Africa come, which was very cool. Some of these faces you might see around you. The participants, on the other hand, again, gave their extremely valuable opinions, thoughts, and expertise as well in the breakout groups. There was no line between the two, as I said. Um, at the end, all the participants made slides describing what they learned and the next steps that they're planning to take, and they kind of presented it to everyone. I already mentioned that, but um, sadly, six participants could not make it due to visa issues, which is something we're still kind of working on. These are the list of participants. So again, many from North America, but we also had someone from Australia, Uruguay, and Sweden. So a nice international group for our first group meeting. And it really needs to be emphasized. And I know this has been said several times over the past two days, but this is why we're here. It's this interconnection of the networks. And really this kind of acted as a microcosm to these bigger groups that many of these people at the meeting are members of these bigger networks, such as BINA, Global Bioimaging, Labby, Canadian Bioimaging, CZI. And it's really, you know, past events from these networks actually brought a lot of the people to the course. So Claire was here in Mexico in, uh, in February talking to many of these people, and many of those people actually ended up there. So it can't be emphasized the value of actually communicating when you're at these things. And not only that, um, obviously these networks super help fund the event. So critical so that the event can occur and participants and instructors could come. So to give credit where credit's due, Bina provided the funding to participants from North America as well as faculty travel. Global Bioimaging provided funding to international participants as well as faculty travel and food. And CZI provided funding for organizational fees. We always like to team up with companies when they do this and um, more than just the financial contributions they give, they also send representatives and we're very friendly with many of these people and they come and not only are they just contributing financially, as I said, but intellectually, they give their opinions at these talks. They really contribute in more ways than just money. And then you have people like Lane who bring us cool mugs. So thank you, Lane. We also had an outreach event, which was heavily spearheaded by Yusuf, who is also in the audience here. It was basically a kids camp day where uh, we had a science microscopy day that was actually inspired by Mexico Bioimaging. We brought about 30 microscopes and planned little activities where everyone, participants and instructors would have little kids come look at fingerprints, plants, hairs, all these types of things. And really, I would say when people were reflecting at the end, it was one of the things that really stood out. So highly recommend putting outreach events in your programs. This is a group picture here. Uh, this had to be put in because there was a shocking amount of crazy cat people at the meeting. So this is uh, for them. I also found out Diego the other night is also a crazy cat person, so fitting. But essentially that was the course format, some recurring ideas that came up, obviously super key to know your target audience. 
everyone was really emphasizing modular sections that can be customized. And this is kind of how we were trying to approach it. We wouldn't give everyone just, here's the lecture on the fluorescent microscope, let's say. We broke it down into parts. So if you don't need 20 slides on cameras in the course that you're trying to form, you don't have to use that. And they have access to all these different broken down modular sections. Tuned to the length of time, we'll see how I do today, but that's an obvious one. Uh, there was a lot of interesting debate on theory versus practical. There's a lot of people in the camp of teach the practical skills and those in the camp of the theory is just as important to make sure that they understand why they're doing something. And this one is specifically for Adon, detail slide titles he uh, brought up many times, but it's all about scrutinizing every element of the slides that you're presenting to make sure they're as ideal as possible and get through to the people as much as possible. This AI assisted summary is probably a, a hyperbolizing the whole thing. It was just basically, I took all the notes and threw it through chat GPT and asked it to summarize and pull out some uh, key findings. But I mean, it's a good tool for a first step in consolidating when you have these tons of notes that came from all these small group meetings. So some positive feedback, uh, clear organization, use of visuals and slides, providing online resources, some constructive criticism, aligning slides with clear learning objectives, highlighting key takeaways, maybe emphasize these more. So all these things kind of help us when we're gonna redesign the course to make it better and as good as possible. And then additional topics, obviously some people were suggesting we do certain topics, some of which we had the slide deck. We only had a week to do this, so we couldn't do everything, but also talk about what you can do when you don't have materials available and in proper use, things of this nature. We always send a survey to everyone too, which has a lot of questions to kind of measure the impact and get their very much honest feedback because it's all anonymous and they might say something to your face so that, ah, that was all great. And then they walk away and think it was garbage, but this gives them the opportunity to actually speak their mind. But we were very happy to see that it was very positive results. And we plan to resurvey the group one year after to see if what they learned has been applied, what's the actual impact of doing these types of courses for people. Some things to consider or potential changes to be made. So these first two points, I'm not sure if they're good ideas because part of the charm of this was having this wide range of expertise there. It kind of led things in interesting ways that we weren't expecting. But you could also see uh, two different kind of courses because you had the junior microscopists who never ran a course, who were looking for materials to build their own course. And they might've thought it might be losing focus when some of the senior people who already have their own courses kind of wanted to more talk about how courses are done or how to get a wealth of material together. So you could see potentially breaking it up into two different workshops where one is focused on specifically junior and one in senior, but um, that might take away some of the charm, like I said, so I don't know, but um, obviously revamping to have clear overviews and just get it uh, avoid a confusion at all. This was the first time we ran this, so sometimes you're a bit learning along the way. And the issues with obtaining visas is a, in time is a big problem. So some future plans, I'm not sure why that came out. Um, beyond that, a different design could be something like uh, have different instructors from different facilities each day doing how they teach a specific topic to really get a different overview of different ways of teaching. Uh, really want to keep the online resource availability and consolidate the notes in a better way than chat GBT just, but uh, key important things. And then like one of the biggest things is about having these continuation. It's like having a friend who leaves town and it gets easier and easier not to stay in communication with them. But if you keep pushing group meetings month to month, you stay in contact. I think you develop better relationships and you continue to learn and collaborate. We are already planning a virtual form of the meeting that we're gonna do early next year. We're gonna revamp it so it can fit in a virtual form and also with the things we learned from the first one to accommodate the people that couldn't make it with visas. And, you know, doing talks at places like this where more people can learn about it, more people can join us in these efforts and potentially just do your own, just copy us if you like. Um, is very important and as well multiple participants at McGill and people that were there are writing articles on the events. 
this is just a group collage. I think I'm running out of time. So I do want to spend a minute or so uh, on this slide because it's important to me, mostly because of the octopus, but no. Uh, really uh, deep thanks to, to Labby and Bina, all the organizers, and uh, Bina especially for inviting me to do this talk in this beautiful waking dream of a place with all you wonderful people. Uh, it's, it's quite an honor. Uh, specifically, I want to thank uh, Nikki and Vanessa. You're two of the hardest working, most patient people I've met. Uh, Global Bioimaging, Claire, thank you for being an awesome boss and for giving me a place in this community. It's really appreciated. Uh, my colleagues who aren't here today, too bad for them. And um, I didn't put this here, but I mean, the staff at the Hacienda has to be said, they are absolutely amazing. And I, I kind of ended with just all the instructors and participants, because I think the main lesson I learned from all this and coming to a meeting like this is that when you get the right good group of people together, you can create something that's much greater than just the sum of its parts. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. And I'd like to invite each of the presenters back up to have a seat in the front as we open up to Q&A, and we're going to start the Q&A with online audience, if you're ready. All right. And we have microphones available to come around and allow you to share your question primarily so the people online can hear the question, because without in the room we can hear you, but they can't. All right, so if the online is still waiting, let's go ahead and ask the room. Do you have questions for our presenters? And while you're, okay, we've got one. Um, it's more of a comment. Like I noticed that we talked a little bit about tissue prep, particularly, um, um, it involved with so I am I'm sort of giving my offer to if you want to try and do some sort of tissue prep work then I'm in for doing something like that. Wonderful, thank you for that comment. Questions, Adan. Thank you. All. So this this question is for all you three guys. Uh, and it's related to mobility of international participants. So we have seen that uh, sometimes it's easy from, from, from moving between countries, but there are other countries that cannot reach the, the places. We have seen here, we have seen going to US, going to GBI, and it's, it's a visa problem sometimes. Sometimes it's a transit visa. I wonder if you, you have thought if, if as a community can come with a solution to 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 try to the to help the the partici participant to actually get into our courses. Okay, so I'll rephrase that. Have any of you had experience with visa problems that you found good solutions to? I mean, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to this. I'm a privileged Canadian who everyone just thinks it's going to go play hockey somewhere else. So no one cares about uh, visas for me. But um, I know Karen spoke about this a bit at our meeting. And some of it was uh, so sad to the point of there seems to be negative loopholes that exist where the time frame in which you need to actually apply for a visa versus the time frame that it comes are incompatible. So it's almost a loophole that prevents completely from getting visas. So actual solutions to this. I know Global Bioimaging is working a lot about kind of uh, providing funding for EOE experiences like Claire was saying before. Um, but uh, the virtual thing for now is kind of one option, but it's it's not great because so much of what you get is when you're with the other people and you're, you're chatting over coffee that you might spark a collaboration rather than sitting behind your computer and then closing it when it's done. But um, I'm bypassing Phil's rephrasing, sorry. Um, I'm not going to talk about visas, but the funding issue is definitely one that we have talked about in our last meeting of the corporate partners group at BINA. And the problem is that 
certainly say for the Woods Hole courses, right? They find out, say, in June that they've got a place and the course is mid-August. And even if they can get the visa in time, they can't get the funding in time. And then if, if we were to reach out to the companies at that point, that's too late for them to get the funding. So we've agreed we need to have a pot of money sitting there just to fund people to attend them, that it's ready to go right then and there. And so we're trying to work out if this is something that Bina could do through the company sponsorship, or people suggested, how about like a GoFundMe campaign, which is not a bad idea because many of the people who um, speak at these courses actually give their honorarium back to the institute, you know, towards the course. But actually when I brought up the idea of them giving it instead to support somebody to attend the course, they were even more enthusiastic. So I think you'd find that there are a lot of scientists out there who'd be like, sure, I would donate $200 to make sure someone could attend a course. And then you'd obviously have to have some kind of committee evaluating it fast to say who was, you know, really worthy of it. But in a sense, if they've already been accepted for a course, that is pre-approval, right? We've already said these are people worthy of it. So what we need is just a pot so we can do instant funding instead of having them search around. Uh, well, the only thing that I can mention is that thanks to <laughs> thanks to the invitation to the BNA meeting last year, I got my visa approved on, on time. So for Mexicans, it, it, if you ask for uh, for your for your appointment to get the visa, they can give you like a year from from the moment that you ask for it but if you have a supporting letter from from an institution to to give a course or to give a talk they can give you your visa like like really fast so maybe uh the only thing that i could say about this it's good organization like having having uh everything prepared on time the invitation having having it on time so so it can be beneficial to the to the invited person so question from online Participant. Yes, Elka from Montreal asks, Allison, do any of the big courses have virtual components? And I also... <laughs> Sorry, we got a little feedback there and I do have one more question afterwards from another audience member. <laughs> um, our course does not. And um, we've thought about it. And it just adds to the complexity so much. And there's so much of the course is interspersed lectures and practicals, but we're not quite sure how you would do this virtually. Plus there are lectures at 8 a.m. and there are lectures at 10 p.m. And how you would then contend with different time zones. I'm really not sure how you would actually do the course virtually. And I suspect the others are all the same, but I could be wrong. I just don't know. Sorry, and then we had one other question. Oh, I see another one's come through as well online. But what Lisa Cameron asked, what did you learn about the train the trainer that was most important aspect, if there was one? Uh, I guess making the connections between people. I mean, that's that's what it all comes down to, really. It's, it's a weird community in that, at least it's weird to me being fairly new to it because I'm so used to the academic community, the research community that's often very combative and competitive. And then I come to this community and it's this warm, welcoming place where people are willing to give themselves a ton of extra work just so that other people can benefit. And I guess personally, what I took out of that is is all that, even though I was being one of the people that was giving their time and, and efforts to do this, it was just clear that everyone wanted to do that. Everyone wanted to make it better for everyone else. And uh, that was pretty magical. And I, I want to add something, being a, a faculty on it, which is that I learned so much from the other people. So I learned from Claire and others, various demos that I've already shown in OMIPS. I learned from my Mexican colleagues a lot about how to go out into communities and teach people who don't know what microscopes are. And I learned a lot from the outreach events. So everybody learned from each other. I think that was amazing. All right, we've got more in the room here. Microphone. All 
All right, cool. Thank you. Um, so kind of in the interest of trying to capture what people have already created and maybe also help some of the people who couldn't get visas or miss the course for whatever reason, is there any interest in putting some of these materials in whatever form they currently exist online as a, a community resource in Microsoft DB or somewhere that people in general can access it? Do you think that would be useful, helpful, whatever? I mean, we haven't specifically talked about doing that just yet, but absolutely, it's a great idea. I mean, a lot of these slides come from the work that Claire's done, and she's the type of person that wants to share with people if it can help them. Uh, we did find, we feel like the actual describing of how everything's done was fairly important. It, it's a bit maybe much if you just give tons and tons of slides and say, figure it out yourself. Uh, it might not be as helpful. So right now it is kind of uh, just control to the people that were part of the course but over time we want to build not only the materials have other people that were instructors add their own materials too i mean there's a lot of people talking about they're going to have a what the specs they use for a 3d printed this and that and put it on there too and um as we do more of these if we do more of these in the future then more people will be part of it. We'll get to grow the group in that fashion. So no direct plans right now, but it could be something in the future for sure. Hi, um, yeah, great. So I had two questions on that and the question about visas and just accessibility in general. So one was the idea of using your embassies. So I don't know, in, in Europe, for example, there was European Research Night and so on, where many people at the same time could have access to a lot of the work that is done. So in your embassies elsewhere, I don't know, every whatever, six months or so, organize an event where, you know, you send little kids or whatever, where people can have access to these same training materials that you're developing. And the other is using the outreach groups of the of these big organizations to also help in that. So one, one I don't know, I'm chair of the outreach in Labby, and this is one of the things precisely that we want to, to bridge that gap, right? To probably, you know, get some of the redundant or not, um, workshops that you're organizing in your countries and making them available everywhere in Latin America, for example. So something like that, what do you think about it? And is it something you want to do? I don't know. I mean, they sound like great ideas. Um, I, I do feel like my knowledge of the subject is pretty low to be constantly um, trying to give my opinion of it, but anything that can be helping these people get the help they need, uh, we're 100% for, and they already will have access to the materials that we did. They were accepted to be part of our course, and really the thing about moving forward is giving more of our time to make sure that they can actually learn how we would teach the material as well as you know just ongoing always be available if someone wants to email us to say i don't get slide 13 can you help me out with this you know everyone at the staff i think is or at the facility is very like-minded to just 100 percent give their time but reaching out to the embassies is a great idea and yeah any program possible would be great Uh, hi, uh, so uh, this is Katerina. Um, so the idea of, so people cannot move to the global north. So maybe one idea would be to, since we're talking about training the trainers, I wonder if it is possible to have a team of people that goes where, the, where it's harder for people to come. Maybe it's easier for us. And so, and do like basically plant, you know, uh, seeds of then spreading around. Uh, and also it might be cheaper because, I mean, then we have to just move a, one person or two people instead of moving a lot of people north. So maybe as we are developing all of these communities, I mean, for example, Mexico is already doing it and maybe they can just learn how to do this and other communities can um, be interested in doing this. 
just a comment and i'm wondering what you think no i mean yeah that's that's a great idea i mean i guess we we stepped into that world slightly by having karen come from south africa to do that so now she will have the kind of skills and resources to potentially do it but sending some of us along the way would be amazing as well and you're absolutely right if uh, you can't you got to bring the mountain to muhammad so to speak uh, sometimes and that could be the best option to get this through I just wanted to add that there is precedent for this already in Sweden. I know they do a kind of roadshow where there's a whole group of people from one institute and they go around and they'll do run the same course in multiple different cities. So this is something that I think would be very useful for Mina to do, get a group of people who could run around and do this. We had another online audience comment that I think relates to the same idea um, from Victoria Repetto asking around regarding funding. Labby has two calls per year to attend courses, and unluckily they're um, usually for assisting Latin American courses specifically. So can we fix this and include BINA courses or something? Or maybe there's, as the idea was suggested, there's ways that our communities can work together. So um, that was a comment, but again, if there's any further comments from the, the panelists. I can make a comment if you like. Um, they could also look for global bioimaging um, job shadowing and maybe combine that with a course. And I believe that's open call anytime, but whoever's hosting the course would have to be registered as a global bioimaging host. So that could be one possibility around it. All right, other questions? Uh, so this is Xiang Wang. I'm from uh, University of Utah. So my question is a little bit selfish and uh, but maybe like practical. So uh, so we have like 300 users per year. We have like 20 uh, instrument. Um, we I do think we need to uh, give our uh, users a good training, uh, but not like a you guys level. You know, it's more like a local you know university level. So to initiate this kind of uh, training, what I mean, how, how can I like start it? And also, what what kind of uh, difficulty uh, uh, probably I can face? Um, and uh, is there any like a program uh, from Bina can provide consultation for you know organizing or in, to help like community like uh, Utah to initiate? you know, this kind of training. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to poll the audience. How many people in this room already provide for their user community a formal, either introductory, basic, or advanced course? By raise of hand, how many here already do this? So, Sean, look around. These are all people who do this already. Now, the question for Bina is, can we pull this information together to be able to provide it to our membership? And that's something we'll put in the queue. So clearly yeah. it's being done. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. But I didn't know. Yet. Yeah. So okay. So Christina Bear has put a number of um training videos online and she presented at the GBI meeting back in February, and she has presented a number of, of other venues. But you can go on to her website and see a lot of the training videos that she uses for training users to use the instruments in her facility. But it would be a great idea to start pulling those together. Yes. Thank you. I would also say just don't underestimate the companies. So many of the companies will be very happy to come in and do training on their instrument for a large number of users. And they'll come in and do that repeatedly, in my experience. So um, just make sure that you're involving them as well. Other questions from people who have not had a chance to ask a question so far? Hello, I just want to make, make a comment following the comment of Catherine. Um, we organize an artificial intelligence uh, meeting in Latin America where the idea is move the trainers and move locally the students. 
We've been doing that for two events now. We gather more than 600 students, PhD students and master students from Latin America, and we move, let's say, 60 trainers. Uh, and everything was done with donation from companies like Google, Meta, Amazon, Apple, all that. So instead of train the trainers, let's say move the trainers <laughs> closer to the people who need to train. Excellent. Uh, if you want to see this, we have our meeting is called Kipu, K H I P U dot A I. I can talk about that if you want. Yes. And I was at a meeting in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago on nanofabrication, and one of the uh, two of the presentations were on exactly that. They've created buses, little buses with um, devices in it, and they drive it around to the communities, especially the underrepresented communities, and allow the, the kids to come in and sort of see for themselves what a, what's a semiconductor, what is what does the fabrication process look like. So once again, drive to them because it's often, particularly for people of color and that are um, don't have a history of higher ed in the family, coming to campus is very intimidating. Coming to your facilities is not something that they are in a rush to do. So we talked about this nationally, bring it to them if you can. And I think microscopy is one of those technologies that is mobile and you can bring it to them. And we heard some of that uh, that you're doing in Mexico with the schools and you know their libraries and all kinds of other venues in which one can um, find neutral territory to get off campus and to bring it to the communities. All right, any other questions? Online? Do we have any more online? Okay, still we have time in the room. Um, again, more of a comment, sorry, not much on the questions today. But as somebody who's dealt with the American um, immigration system for you know 15 years and being a little bit of a weirdo, there's definitely some tips and tricks that you can use and you can we can give out to people in what to do and what not to do when you come into the country, um, as well as sort of before that sort of maybe listing out and making making links easy enough for people to be able to understand because the the whole system in the different countries is so confusing, mm. and so it's really hard to figure out what exactly you're supposed right so having some tips and tricks and then it's not just getting the visa it's what you do when you get into the country as well um, so I think we could pull those things together and make them available great idea anyone else in the room have a question for our esteemed panel if not maybe I'll throw it back to Nikki to close us out all right, thank, let's thank again our panel for their contributions.